Hey everyone, so um, I think we can get, get started. You know, but, um, st people start trickling in, but um, thanks for showing up for um, this um, session of uh, uh, multimodal weekly. Let me share quickly share the screen to talk about the logistics of the event before we get started. Yeah, so this is a webinar series hosted by a team of uh, 12 apps, and we do it every Friday at 1.30 p.m. to uh, 2.30 uh, Pacific time. Uh, here are some of the topics that we'll cover every Friday, uh, including some newest research topic in multimodal AI. Uh, can be you know some interesting multimodal application in different verticals, um, any relevant uh, video or projects that you'd like to share. And then um, some some of the more like infrastructure topics, and sometimes we're going to have a uh, speaker from our team to talk about the tools and guys using uh, to adopt API. Uh, so we have already have like three sessions so far. Here are some of the topics that we cover um, uh, in the previous weeks. Uh, so today agenda we'll have um, three speakers: Vishakha um, Gupta from Apache Data, who will talk about um, you know the the use of vector database for visual use cases. Um, we'll have uh, Rani Pesula, um we'll, we'll talk about um, you know, so his perspective and application in multimodal learning, and then how Brett can join a bit later, talk about his experience building um, a partition model for object detection. Um, quickly, just note, feel free to send any question that you have on the chat, um, ask the speaker, present, and um, you know, we'll have a final Q&A session once all the uh, presentation uh, are finished. Yep. So with that in mind, good luck to have um, Vishaka to you know, start sharing the screen and um, present George or um, for talk about the database. Can you guys see my screen? Mm -hmm. yep. And hear me all right? Yep. All right, so let's get started. I'm happy to kick it off. Um, thanks so much, James and So Young, for inviting me for this webinar. And wow, yet another discussion on vector databases, as if we haven't heard enough. Maybe we haven't, so let's see. Um, given that you know we at Aperture Data have been working on vector search and classifications uh, for a few years now, in the context of finding similar items for visual recommendations and classification with our smart retail customers, we thought it would be interesting um, to understand what vector data what vector databases offer in the context of vision use cases, and evaluate them from the perspective of what's needed to simplify the overall visual data pipeline for data scientists and data engineers. Sorry, kind of. All right. Um, so I'm going to ground this discussion based on what we have learned from our current customers, as well as some of the other in progress use cases that we've been looking at and working together with them. That's just like a quick recap, as you all might already know, a visual embedding feature vector or descriptor. And people use a lot of different, these terms interchangeably at time is a lower dimensional representation or signature of the image or video. Typically, a series of numbers taken from some of the last layers of a model used for inference. So an example of a visual embedding would be 128 to 256 dimensional feature vector extracted from an example model. These could, of course, be much larger in dimension too, depending on uh, your specific use case. So what do we do with these? By nature of what they represent, uh, the most common use of embeddings in visual space is to find similar images or videos, even when you don't have any keywords or other information attached to them. And that operation of finding similar image or video, that in itself leads to a few complex requirements for which we need special support, creating the need for a vector database. As a data, sci data scientist or an entire team is using their well-trained models to extract embeddings, they need a location to efficiently index these. Um, those indexes and some clustering and other algorithmic magic can then help a vector database return a label for a given embedding based on its closest matches, which is classification, or return the other closest vectors in the given search space and using a distance metric of your choosing, which is typically what we'll refer, uh, what we refer to as the K near neighbor searches or similarity search. Now, being able to classify a given vector means if you take picture of a product on a grocery store aisle, for example, you could say that it was a cereal box or olive oil, and you could figure out if it was misplaced, which is the classic inventory management problem. 
or you could suggest all the visually similar products to a customer so they buy more, uh, which is the visual recommendations problem or find other instances, let's say where you had seen a similar defect when manufacturing a processor chip. Uh, processor chip. So these are all the various use cases and these are hard problems, but as you can see, they are very valuable um, to, these, to these companies who wanna implement them. Um, as, and you guessed it, can be typically solved with the help of a vector database. Of course, visual use cases are not the only reason why we've been hearing about them so much, uh, but that's what we'll focus on today. So when there are so many choices in the market, how do people choose what solves their problems? That depends in case of, you know, in case of vector database, depends not only on the specific use case, uh, but also on cost, scale, algorithms, distance metrics supported, whether it's a SaaS or, or an on-premise option, uh, whether they extract embeddings automatically and capabilities expected beyond similarity search and classification. Uh, when it comes to visual data, the list of expectations goes even further beyond challenges addressed by these solutions, um, as we'll see in the, in the next couple of slides. Now, through our user interactions, we've learned how some of these vector database, uh, databases can be deployed for use cases similar to the ones I was just talking about. And while these vector databases were able to solve um, problems of vector indexing and search challenges the customers faced, when we started digging deeper, what caught our attention was what the data pipeline and architecture looked like for their overall um, visual use cases, which typically started from point of collecting data, training models, and then using these models to extract these embeddings themselves. Unfortunately, the, what, 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 uh, it, what it showed us and what we learned was that vector databases were really just solving a piece of the problem. Um, let me walk you through just how their visual data system, management systems evolved and how they became extremely messy over time as they wanted to walk through, take their input data, transform it into, and, and transform it into useful outputs, like let's say recommendations or models to deploy, or even data to display to users. So, you know, you start out with receiving different uh, types of data, like images, videos, and metadata, let's say like serial box information, or which processor chips from which factory and what did the camera capture in a video. Naturally, that goes into storage buckets on cloud, in cloud or on premise, and some choice of databases. Depends on who's setting things up. Then very often, you need label data for training models. It means now bringing in manual or automatic labelers that need access to these data sets. And then taking these annotations in whichever format and finding a way to land them either in those cloud, bu cloud buckets or actually put in the effort to make them into metadata in database so you can search them later. So that is when you write your own scripts to combine all this information together so that you can return a data set either to a framework or to a front end for display. Sometimes, especially when it comes to uh, image and video data, you might need very finicky computer vision libraries to process them into the right format or augment them into what your models or display might expect. Finally, for building systems for recommendations or classification, you bring in the vector database, uh, which needs to be connected with the metadata database and cloud buckets, often through unique IDs of the represented images or videos. It's tiring even to say that whole thing on how many pieces of software you need to put together to solve the problem. Um, that's what, uh, so doing that, even though you try to use every, uh, uh, you try to use the right product for every data type, uh, what that ended up looking like is this complex glued together spaghetti system that is brittle and painful to maintain and reuse. Imagine what that looks like with multiple use cases and users as you continue to evolve. Infrastructure like, you know, what Aperture DB would offer to replace this, um, expected by the data science teams, can actually take a lot of time and resources to create and complicate the rest of the workflow. In fact, you'd be surprised at how much that technical debt actually ends up costing in, in uh, these deployments. So really through numerous conversations and our systems experience, what we realized in these cases was that we were missing a database that understood the overall challenges of visual data management, and it could offer something easy to adopt by the data science, to be adopted by the data science community. And that's what we built with Aperture DB. It's a purpose-built visual data management system for analytics. Our biggest value proposition is that we integrate functionalities of a vector database, intelligence graph, and visual data to seamlessly query across uh, data domains. Does that mean? 
means that Aperture DB natively supports management of images and videos, including any augmentation or pre-processing through our query API. Given how key metadata is to all of the, to combining all of these things together, we manage application metadata as a knowledge graph, uh, in-memory knowledge graph, uh, which helps us capture internal relationships between metadata and data and enable complex metadata-based visual searches. And you know, since we were thinking about machine learning applications from the very beginning, um, we also support bounding box or polygons uh, for labeling or annotation-based searches as part of this metadata. And as a third way of finding the relevant data, third very key way of finding relevant data, we also offer vector search and classification, uh, and you can index any dimensional feature vectors in, into that. And I'll talk more about it and give you some, show you some examples. Now, since you know, one of the important goals for us was to not have our users have to deal with multiple systems, worry about consistency across these systems. Um, Aperture DB uses a query engine or orchestrator that'll uh, redirect user queries to the right components, uh, collect the results to return a coherent response to the user. And it exposes a unified JSON-based native API to machine learning pipelines and end users. Uh, these pipelines and our users can then execute queries to add, modify, search, visual data and metadata, annotations of feature vectors. They can perform on-the-fly visual data pre-processing as they are accessing the data. Or you can do more machine learning tasks, like let's say you need to snapshot data or do data set management. So basically, you can use our API to run vector, vector queries, metadata filtering, and image or video manipulation within a single transaction and rely on AppertureDB keep scaling as your application requirements and data grow. And as you can see, the right kind of database can really simplify your overall data pipeline and allow you to focus on data understanding, which is what you originally set out to do. So let's take a quick look at what our similarity search uh, function looks like. Um, you might have worked with, with Coco Dataset. Let me pull up the other screen. So you might have worked with Coco Dataset, which is readily available, comes with over 200,000 images and quite a bit of metadata about, Im uh, about the images, particularly bounding boxes on them. So we first used an existing model hybrid net to extract embeddings based on these images and index them in Aperture DB. These are 4K embeddings. Uh, are there any questions on the chat, by the way? Sorry, I see some. No, uh, not, not at this point. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to go to the window and Zoom seems to be taking up all the space. All right. Um, yeah, so we use, um, and so, you know, we use, uh, we index uh, 4K uh, dimensional embeddings for this particular use case. And now let's say what you wanted to do is there is, you, you have a data set. Let's just query some images, find the data set. Um, what you will, so what, what I just did was use some metadata property and found uh, images that are already in the database. And let's say I wanna find images that are similar to this particular one. Um, so I can just search that image by its ID. And um, you guys can see my screen okay for the notebook too? All right. Um, and here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect with that instance of Aperture DB where we saw the image. I want to use that particular images ID, and I'm going to find that image just to show you. And that's the image. Um, I resized it to a smaller size, so that's why it's so small, and it was bigger on this other screen. And now what I want to do is I want to find its corresponding descriptor. So I want to take that particular embedding and use it to find 10 closest neighbors to that image. So first, what we are gonna do with this, uh, so this is the um, so Aperture DB API is very simple. We recognize certain uh, visual objects as key um, entities. So we have images, videos, descriptors, rounding boxes, polygons, um, and you can add, find, update, delete, like any uh, classic database. Uh, and so here we are gonna find 10 closest neighbors for that particular descriptor that we have chosen. And then because those descriptors are related or connected to the images, we are gonna be able to traverse that within the same database, within that one transaction to get uh, the corresponding images as well. 
So what happens here is I found 10 closest descriptors. We even got how far the distance metric here, we used L2 distance. Um, and because we could traverse and go to the corresponding images within the same database, within the same transaction, you also get corresponding images in this case. Um, and you know, depending on how good your model is, you may or may not find buses when you're looking for trains. And um, the other thing we kind of did recently, uh, so it's just part of our team hackathon, uh, was let's we used flip model to extract the combination of embeddings with uh, text and images. And we index them into Aperture DB as well. So what I'm gonna do is, um, it's connecting to the database, importing the different packages. And here, I wanna find pizza images, just Friday. So here, because it's a combination of the text and image embeddings, what I can enter a search term for pizza and hope that it shows me a bunch of pizzas. Now, let's say I wanted to create a data set of a you know, specific pizza that, I, that looks good to me. So I choose, I choose a specific, so you know, if you go back, there is some information here about you know, the metadata that you can pull and you can choose a specific pizza say this one, it's half and half here, and I wanna find similar pizzas. So here again, but with a different descriptor set because we extracted this using the clip and embedding, uh, we extract, we get images for other pizzas. And there you can actually create your training data sets starting like this. So even though you originally did not have metadata to filter on, you started with an image, you could take the descriptor of that image and, and find close matches to in case you wanted to train a model to recognize different pizzas. Um, so that's just a quick um, overview. There's a lot of other features to talk about, which we don't have time to cover today, but I'm happy to show more examples offline. Got a surprise, the vector database capabilities within Aperture DB, uh, we offer a flexible API uh, for search and classification. Uh, it's built on top of uh, Meta's uh, phase, phase three, but modified for create, read, update, delete functionalities and memory efficiency to work within database transactions. And um, easily choose among different algorithms and configurations for proximate near neighbors and different standard distance metrics uh, when getting K near neighbors. So it's very flexible. Um, and once you once we just explain the API to you, it'll become pretty like straightforward to start uh, playing with different combinations. And for a customer workload that is now live in production, we have 12,000 KNN queries per second recall uh, on a search space of about 2 million vectors, which is what the flow is right now, um, and 64 dimension feature vectors on a single machine instance of our um, Depending on specific configurations, it actually was two to four times faster very popular vector database, um, which prompted our customer to very recently switch over all their uh, robots over to Aperture DB to do the vector, 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 uh, vector classification. We'll have a case study about that in a few weeks. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, we're just gathering the scale out number. So I'm just curious to see how far we go in the throughput on that one. Um, so what if uh, so the other question we get often is, what if you're working with embeddings and metadata, but not visual data, maybe let's say PDFs. We get this question uh, because, well, clearly a lot of people are working on documents now and understanding what's happening in them. Uh, we are agnostic to how the embeds are derived. Because they are always so application specific, as a database, we just let, let our users uh, extract embeddings. Um, and our metadata can be adapted to any application. Uh, you can store. PDFs or any other uh, source data as generic blobs in Aperture DB. In fact, our documentation has all the uh, all the API for it. Um, and so, yeah, you could certainly store um, non-visual use cases as well. Uh, we will have some more examples on that in the near future. But for now, you know how to find us uh, for any questions, trying things out, or even building with Aperture DB. So, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Mr. Shaka. I uh, really appreciate you showing your, uh, you know, some some of the differences here. Um, you know, if, if anyone have any more like question, um, you can put them in the chat for her to respond. Um, uh, in the meantime, and and also like if you can just share the uh, 
if, if the notebook tutorials that you share uh, on the presentation, if, if it is like public somewhere, yeah. it could be great if you could also put it in your chat so people can learn and start sharing the screen. Like, try it out. Um, it's possible. Yep. Um, so with that, uh, yep, uh, I'll let uh, our second speaker, uh, Pani Basula, to uh, present his, his perspective and application in uh, multimodal learning for learning. Yep. So, uh, Pane, can you uh, start sharing the screen? My name is Pane Kasula. Uh, what I'll be talking about is multimodal learning for learning. Um, what I really wanted to do was focus on League of Legends, so I could focus. I could have the title "Multimodal Learning for Learning League of Legends," and then be like, "LOL squared." Um, but regardless, uh, I'll briefly go through some perspectives. Uh, and it'll be very open-ended and very, um, I don't want to use the term vague. I think open-ended is probably a, a synonym that uh, just sounds better. So very happy to address any questions that arise. Um, this is a relatively new field when it comes to incorporating a lot of modalities um, or modalities in a way that uh, are more than just like plug and play, uh, as in say, let me just throw different modalities to my model and see what works. Nowadays, there's a lot more things like tokenizers. Uh, there's a lot more emphasis on data heterogeneity. Um, do different modalities help? Do they hurt, et cetera? And I'm very happy to answer any of those questions. Uh, so I'm a research scientist at J.P. Morgan AI Research Lab, and uh, head a lot of, or if not, pretty much all of the multimodal foundation model learning, um, and multi-agent system simulation and applications that incorporate these uh, multimodal foundation learnings to bootstrap uh, the learning of of agents in in uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning uh, domains. All right, so I'd love to have animations, um, but just so just so they kind of give you some focus and some some suspense. But an overview of this talk is is uh, where are we in a general sense when it comes to multimodality uh, trends, perspective, and forward plan. So that's the where can we go? I'll give you a specific application that I've been using. Uh, admittedly a bit personally as an AI tennis coach and happy to answer questions related to the work that I do at JP Morgan, except that it is all highly confidential. And so it's difficult to actually give you like an application overview um, in terms of that. So that's why I focused on this AI tennis coach, which actually incorporates a lot more modalities than, than the JP Morgan um applications do the results those will be very short because it's an ongoing process uh, but there are a lot of ideas that i have to improve on the results that i've gotten all right so historically there's been a large focus on vision and language and vision includes uh, videos as well as uh, images so on the left and the right most notably, we have ImageNet. So uh, December 2012, Alex Kruszewski published his paper um, and got just black and white better results on uh, ImageNet top certain percent classification task. And for in, around 2018, uh, maybe published in 2019, I think 2018, but it came out in 2017, was, uh, was Bert. Um, the two of the biggest, well, were not really known as at the time, but now considered foundation models that allowed us to bootstrap um, the learning of downstream tasks that use images or text to very quickly fine tune, adapt, and learn these downstream tasks that are useful. Since then, uh, there are things like training on a bunch of YouTube videos or other videos. Um, there's actually an additional application uh, that I could 
talk about a little bit, but it would have to do with um, training on uh, Valorant videos and uh, just the, uh, I might give like a very quick um, description of like one high signal opportunity that using Valorant videos and certain multimodal aspects of that can just absolutely make you go from say like bottom 80 percentile to like 10 percentile relatively quickly all right so the one of the points of this talk are to highlight that there are other modalities that exist um and i know i'm showing two time series here but there's going to be a particular reason why i'm showing two uh the first one i thought it was cute the likert scale so the angry face to the to the happy face in green is something that is used, but again, in multimodal aspects, not very often. And I'll tie this to the AI tennis coach example, um, where after a point, or maybe more so when you're less emotionally charged during a break, you can use uh, a Likert scale input to help you. And it does help, by the way, just a little preview. Uh, in helping you assess the predictivity of whatever your target variable is, and that's typically to win, uh, or two could be to improve. Uh, another modality is on the right, EEG signals. So these are the EEG signals of someone who is undergoing an epileptic seizure. And this is quite plug and play time series sequential data. Uh, that's numerical. And you'll see that there are distribution shifts and whatnot. Um, there are modalities that can be extracted from modalities. So from both the time series data, um, but let's focus on the epileptic seizures for now. We can see that there are periods where um, for each of the time series, these are different frequency bands. Um, this is coming from someone that worked on uh, electroencephalography in the past. And what you can see are that there is a moment in time that there's quite a distinct shift in the behavior of uh, specific signals in, within specific bands, and that's the onset of the epileptic seizure, or at least part of it is actually um, the onset of it happening in the brain, but not necessarily the outwardly manifestations of it. Okay, so the bottom one I included, which is also time series data, but actually to highlight the gray bars that are present, these are labeled by the National Bureau of Economic Research that indicate whether or not a recession had occurred. So again, not actually focusing on the time series here, but actually focusing on the modality of uh, these, these labels of recession or not recession. Uh, and these were very useful in helping me with a one highlight insights into um, how asset prices, in this case, this is a crude oil daily spot price. Let's make it a little time series. I have to end in a second. Um, how uh, these helped me generate um, contextual labels that help bootstrap learning downstream. And that just regardless, were insightful because when I converted this into a um, volatility, are essentially like the time series um, took the derivative in a sense. You'd see that there is very markedly uh, overlap between the gray bars and the amount of volatility that was present. So distributions of heterogeneity. I'll go through this kind of quickly. This is just the more so general um, idea of, so a particular shape is a particular modality and you could imagine extending this to more than just two you could have squares you could have um other stuff as well 
but just know that all the triangles are the same modality and all the circles are the same but different modality. Uh, there are a lot of considerations to make when we consider you know, well, when you think about different modalities, um, and that is the probability distribution of them. Um, are they structured? So in this sense, uh, really more so the circles, is there like a hierarchical fashion that we can leverage uh, that the red triangles do not have? How much information content is contained uh, within these? And the H here is actually uh, entropy. And so there's pros and cons to having more information content depending on how entropic or not they are. How noisy is the data? This is actually a very, very big deal, especially when you do uh, things such as multimodal fusion, uh, because you could actually have, well, if your data itself is noisy, that alone might make it difficult to use, but you can also um, cause a lot of negative interference by actually combining data, um, which is bad rather than good, you'd actually be better off using just the single modality. And then the relevance here is how relevant is the modality to the target variable Y, um, Y1, Y2, you could have multiple target variables. It should just have probably put that as Y. And this is a reference down here that has this and a lot more um, of the general uh, ideas of what, trends, uh, principles, and things of importance uh, are related to multimodal machine learning. All right, so question inevitably comes when you're thinking about a multimodal project or multimodal learning, uh, what modality should you use? So these are not answers. These are questions that you should ask because I don't know what application you have. Uh, what is the predictiveness on the target variable? There's a reason why I put that first. Um, are you able to, from the data itself, extract insights? Uh, so one example is the uh, daily spot price. Uh, just from an unsupervised fashion, you're able to find that the gray bars correlate very heavily with um, high volatility regimes. How accessible is the data? Super important. Um, and that comes from a, is there any point in even working on this project from uh, using this modality, but more so what's the bang for your buck in incorporating this modality. A lot of times you won't know ahead of time whether or not this modality will be even useful. So that's where I can touch into domain expertise versus um, exploratory. Uh, but for the sake of time, just kind of generalize all of these questions and more to also the benefits of having domain expertise versus not and consider that when I'm talking about the tennis coach example uh, where I was a national level junior player for many years stopped playing tennis for a long time and then started again about a year ago and computational expense that's very fun especially when you're using videos um, and there's a lot of great work in uh, semantic mapping locality sensitive hashing et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how much knowledge do you have about those and what can you do to reduce the computational expense needed? All right, I'll go through this application. So I wonder if I can play this video. Might not be able to, but it's very fun to watch actually. So, and we have, oh, cool. All right, so just to give you a sense of some raw video input, uh, this is actually an application called Swing Vision. And I ended up putting the same video two times there, but there is a much longer one, which is probably good for me to not show for the sake of time. But you'll see that there are not just the raw video input, but we're able to get things like what type of shot was it? When we look at the um, forehand, we can see what speed the shot was at. Uh, we can see that it was a top spin shot and we can see the placement in sequential order of the different shots on this mapping right here. Uh, it's also very, very easy to get things like YOLO V1 million uh, or V8 um, to do things like bounding box detection. So you know where your position is at. And these are all things that I use in the pipeline. So here's some other modalities. Um, you're able to keep track of statistics such as how many winners did you get? Oh no. Uh, how many unforced errors did you have? Uh, game score. And 
this will be generalized in a little bit, but I wanted to give you some visual input as into there's like there's a huge number of signals and of different types. And that's one of the biggest things that I want to get across is this isn't even for like a work application. This is just for everyday life and trying to improve in something. Uh, and it doesn't just have to be for yourself. It can be for something else. And at the end of the day, we're doing machine learning so that we can improve stuff. Uh, so um, second one is a shot distribution chart where what I did specifically was I selected all my backends, showed me my shot spin distribution. Uh, I tend to be a more so flat heading backhander player. And then what that did was it broke it down into swing speed and also gave me um, biosignals such as heart rate. So coming up on 15 minutes now, um, these biosignals are of particular importance because what I've found is as my heart rate gets higher for longer, what I will tend to do is try to end points more quickly and do things like drop shots or go for winners. And often that'll be to the detriment of my overall game like play. So a lot of the stuff that I just showed previously actually generalizes into this tabular format. And this tabular format also has additional stuff such as the duration of the point. And I know very well from my own experience that as the point goes on longer and longer, I actually have gotten to the point where I just I hit a normal shot and I just, my body's so exhausted that it, it does not do what it wants to do. And, uh, it's a, it's a painful phenomenon. So, uh, there is a lot within that pipeline, but again, for the sake of time, uh, I didn't want to go into it too much. I'm about to end in one minute. Um, there is a likelihood of winning as the point goes on. Um, so a real-time inference model that I built. And if you've ever played some games like Dota 2 in particular, they have something like that as well. Uh, and it's interesting to see how much the chart swings. One example result that I got was that as my likelihood of winning a point goes down very significantly, um, which a second video example would have showed you, but I was pretty much pushed out really wide in the court and hit a ball directly to someone who volleyed it um, to the other side of the court, my win probability went down to 1%. And I had to hit one of the most incredible lobs ever, which was a very high risk shot, to win the point. So uh, insight was, one, try not to get into a position where you only have 1% likelihood of winning. So it would have been better if I lobbed the ball when I was pushed out wide to give myself more time to recover. Um, but two, more so, the lower the likelihood, the more risky of a shot that you're going to have to take. All right, so right now, my model tells me that I should lob every single ground stroke with heavy top of it. Um, if you are familiar with tennis at all, this is not how you want to play tennis. <laughs> but it's just how my model tells me uh, to maximize the likelihood of winning the matches that I've trained it on. So there is a lot of work that I need to do in making sure that the inputs that I'm giving it are semantically aligned with the outcomes that I want uh, the model to have. So one of the reasons why it says to lob every ground trick with heavy topspin is because it keeps my heart rate low. And when my heart rate is lower, I tend to make many fewer uh, unforced errors, which are one of the worst things that you can do. Um, so there is uh, very lastly, the one thing that I really want to do with improving this um, model is actually use things like 12 lab video search to find certain positions that are predictive of um, the outcome that I'm aiming for, which are, there are two things. One is to improve, one is to win. And you can always predict on two different target variables at once. Uh, I actually want to use video search to find the positions that I'm in that cause the model a bit of trouble 
in aligning with how I actually wanted to behave in productivity and then to train more heavily on those. So not so much like a hard negative mining sense, but from a domain expertise, I know that I should be looking for these positions. It's very difficult to find those if I just manually look for them. So video search is an option. And with that, I will awesome. stop sharing. All right. Thanks, Brené. Really appreciate you uh, looking to building up application. It's very, 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 very practical, very personal eye. Um, and yeah, like if I can imagine there's a lot of uh, a lot of people, like athletes, right, who, who, who can find beneficial to improve their own like, yeah, skill set. Yeah, so you can, you can generalize this to, to so many things. So it's, uh, mm. it's, it's super interesting to work on it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, 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 uh, yeah. For time, feel free to ask me questions offline. Also, um, I know that there's some questions in chat and stuff, and I'm happy to address every single one offline. Yep, sounds good. Uh, if if there is any like you know public materials like a demo or like code for for the for the project that you know online, yeah, feel free to share it on the chat. Um, you know, yeah, so we'll more do. People it. Uh, with that, yeah, let's let's uh, let's have Harpreet to be the final speaker of uh, this webinar, who's going to talk about uh, some lesson beating uh, the uh, YOLO NAS, uh, which is a foundation model for object detection. So uh, yeah, Habrit, can you uh, share your screen and talk about it? Yeah, for sure. What's going on, everybody? How you guys doing? Let's go ahead and do this. And I will start the presentation now. Cool. So I'm going to talk about lessons learned from building YOLO NAS. It's a new foundation model for object detection. Uh, but first, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Harpreet Sahota. I am uh, building the DevRel team here at DESI. Uh, I've got a diverse experience ranging from actuarial work to biostats to data science leadership and developer advocacy. Uh, today, I'm going to share the story of YOLO NAS from an outsider's perspective. Um, I wasn't involved in the research or engineering efforts, more kind of just getting the word out there and uh, shoring up the developer experience um, but I uh, just want to connect the technical aspects of yellow NAS with the people behind it and discuss some of the lessons that the team had learned so things we're going to talk about today uh, just an introductory discussion on DESI and NAS keep it real quick the importance of NAS and finding yellow NAS architecture uh, journey through the process of building yellow NAS intro to the team and then discussion of key challenges and triumphs um, so here's just a quick overview of DESI um, I'm just not going to talk too much about it, but that's where I work and it's an awesome place. Um, what is interesting, though, is our AutoNAC engine. And so the AutoNAC engine includes algorithms for predicting neural network model accuracy without actually training the model. Uh, and it enables the application of fast and, and powerful search strategies. So how does AutoNAC work? Well, we you know, pass to our AutoNAC engine. Uh, some inputs that's the task that we're trying to accomplish that could be anything from image uh, classification to pose estimation even diffusion models um, characteristics of the training data uh, where necessary and then also the inference environment and hardware so we put all of this into our AutoNAC engine and AutoNAC is really just a proprietary algorithm that performs neural architecture search uh, and then from there the output of that is a new uh, architecture and it's um, a PyTorch uh, NN module that we output um, but we can also accommodate different formats as needed um, kind of under the hood how it works we start with uh, again like I mentioned to the AutoNAC engine we give the task some baseline model inference environment uh, data characteristics and some performance targets uh, from that we create a search space um, then we have a search strategy through that search space and then we have a performance evaluation strategy. And then from there, we get the optimal architecture. So pretty much just typical neural architecture search. We just have a uh, proprietary way of doing it. Uh, but the question is, why create another YOLO? So Desi has a strong research back background. You know, that's about 30, 40% of the company has some sort of advanced degree. Um, and, you know, there's the obvious research driven reasons for wanting to create another YOLO. We want to push the frontier of accurate and fast detection models. We wanted to build a model that was suitable for fine tuning on any data set. We wanted to educate teams on the power of neural architecture search and the importance of hardware or model uh, architectures. And we wanted to build something quantization friendly. But really, 
object detection is highly competitive. It's a super competitive subfield of computer vision. There's teams around the world that are working on object detection, benchmarking on, on Coco using the T4 hardware, and they're all striving for state-of-the-art results. Um, and so we wanted to show that DESI could bring state-of-the-art results and win on this competitive task. And the re results we got, while they did beat state-of-the-art, they aren't huge, right? We didn't surpass the current state-of-the-art by 2x or 10% increase on map. It's an incremental improvement. But incremental improvements can be groundbreaking, kind of like sprinters working on shaving milliseconds off the times for their uh, runs. The point wasn't to show that we could dominate this specific task of hardware, uh, sorry, of, of object detection on that specific hardware and that specific data set being Coco. But we wanted to show that we have the right technology, a solid team, uh, and knowledge that will allow us to dominate any task, any hardware, any data set. Uh, so here's just a, you know, people who are involved in building Yolanas. There's people from the research team, people from the actual uh, open source library, Super Gradients uh, team, uh, as well as product and marketing as well. So let's talk about the journey of building Yolanas. So uh, applying NAS to find a new state of the art for detection is something that our research team wanted to do for a long time, but it turned out to be a challenging task, one that we couldn't get quite right. Um, and so the team reflected on the architecture of previous yellow models. And to date, there have been 15 something other yellow models, right? Prior to yellow NAS, the current state of the art from the YOLO family was YOLO v6, YOLO v7, and YOLO v8. So now our goal was to create a new quantization friendly architecture that was inspired by the success of some modern YOLO architectures. Um, so the initial step in neural architecture search was to define the search space. So for YOLO NAS, we looked at the basic blocks of YOLO v6 and YOLO v8. Uh, and again, they served as inspiration because they generalize well. Um, so then we applied our auto NAC to this search space. And this allowed us uh, to have an intel intelligent you know, exploration of this search space, which was actually 10 to the 14 possible architectures. And from those 10 to the 14 possible architectures, uh, we found three final architectures, the small, medium, and large versions of Yellow and Ass. Um, and these looked to promise some outstanding results with a new quantization-friendly basic block. Um, so Yellow and Ass also had a multi-phase training process that included you know, pre-training on Object 365 and Cocoa pseudo-label data. Uh, we used knowledge distillation and distribution focal loss. Um, you know, if, if you're not familiar with Object 365, it's a data set that has 2 million images, uh, 365 categories. Um, the Coco data set, uh, the test set that we pseudo labeled, had 123,000 images. Um, and we applied knowledge distillation uh, to the loss function, and that enabled a student network to mimic this teacher network's logits. Uh, we used distribution focal loss, and so that learned. Uh, box regressions as a classification task and then discretized box predictions into finite values and predicted distributions over those values. Um, and, you know, we applied all these advanced uh, training techniques and this QR code links to a blog that highlights some of those details. Uh, so if you want to read that, go ahead, please do. But the point here is to talk about lessons learned uh, while building Yellow and NAS. So let's go ahead and jump right into some of the challenges in building Yellow and NAS. Um, first challenge is performance benchmarks. So existing YOLO models are already highly performant and it makes them challenging to surpass, especially on the T4 benchmark. Um, second challenge was hardware aware NAS. Um, you know, applying end to end hardware aware NAS on detection is a rare thing to see and that in itself presents unique challenges. Uh, third is quantization awareness. Um, you know, achieving quantization awareness while maintaining high accuracy is quite difficult. Uh, there's also the fine-tuning aspect, so developing a strategy that's suitable for fine-tuning across various detection data sets. You know, what would we pre-tain on? Uh, then there's also challenges of benchmarking. Like, what, what data set do we want to benchmark on? We uh, chose RoboFlow 100. Uh, it's a benchmark that has 100 separate data sets. Um, you know, this was challenging to us because we were uncertain about the model's performance on, you know, downstream tasks. After we pre-trained on Object 365 and uh, pre-trained on uh, the Coco pseudo-label data set, um, 
we weren't sure how well it was actually going to perform. And so RoboFlow 100 proved to be a good challenging data set. Um, but we didn't know how much training or evaluation we would need to show good results on the 100 data sets. Uh, then on top of that, there is um, limited hyperparameter tuning that we could use uh, on, you know, for given the protocol for RoboFlow 100, um, you know, we couldn't uh, optimize hyperparameters for each individual data set. We had to do it uniformly for for all the data sets. Um, so these were uh, some some challenges for that benchmark. But this also proved to be an opportunity for us because you know if we can make it on RoboFlow 100, we can make it anywhere because successful performance makes a strong case for the new for the ability of this new model to adapt to downstream tasks. Um, and you can see here, we did, we we beat YOLO V8, YOLO V5, YOLO V7, um, not YOLO V6 though, but um, I don't think YOLO V6 actually benchmarked on, on RoboFlow 100. Um, but, you know, we, we beat it by a small margin. Um, you know, it, it's not to say that we're uh, going to stay state-of-the-art forever, but we were able to accomplish what we set out to do, which was set a new state-of-the-art. Um, and if you're interested in some of the details, again, for training, um, you know, here, here's the learning rate, weight decay, batch size, so on and so forth that we used. Uh, we detail it a lot uh, in this blog, so definitely go check that out. Um, some other challenges, though, came kind of from the internal aspect. So we talked about challenges um, about the model and uncertainty about its performance, but we also faced some challenges for uh, internal, uh, one of them being model delivery. Um, you know, we it was proved challenging to manage issue, issues that were encountered during the model delivery process. For example, you know, adapting a state dict from a checkpoint and ensuring that the both networks compute the same. Uh, ablation studies, um, we're deciding what to share publicly from ablation studies and experiment logs um, and considering the potential impact on, you know, from the communities, their, their perception of yellow and ass. Um, results expectations. Um, was something we had to manage as well because we're managing expectations for results in the face of known issues like image size uh, constraints and impacting performance um, that way. Uh, more team uh, struggles that we faced, one being code migration. Like our research team uh, begins to work on whatever, with whatever code base they want, but you know, the official home of YOLO NAS um, is super gradients. Um, so the research team should have started to migrate to a standard code base, uh, super gradients in our case, to streamline development and maintenance. Um, benchmark evaluation, you know, following model handoff between teams, it, we learned that it's important to conduct comprehensive benchmark and evaluations. That way we can ensure that the performance meets our expectations. Uh, protocols for collaboration, um, you know, we noticed that we needed clear protocols uh, in place that should define how we pass code and how written materials are going to transfer between teams to make sure that our collaboration was more smooth and efficient. Um, documents, even like coming to term, like, you know, just I, I, you know, each each document associated with the product needs to have like a clear purpose, uh, set authors, schedule, process outlined. Um, so we learned that if we do this next time, it's going to help us uh, ensure that all the necessary information is captured and understood by all the team members. Uh, DESI is spread out across, um, uh, well, for the most part, they're in Israel, uh, but there's people like me who are in Canada. Um, so working across time zones um, was was something that we had to learn how to do better. Um, we're, we had to find ways to sync our work hours within reasonable limits. Um, so we're trying to create a window of overlap, at least four hours, and you know, shift tasks that require other teams' attention into that window. Uh, but we also did face um, some good triumphs, even though we went through some some struggles. Um, the reception of the community has motivated us to release another open source tool um, that's going to be coming out in in July. But you know, we did achieve a new state of the art. We 10x the pip installs of Super Gradient since the launch. We 4x the GitHub stars. The community has embraced Yellow NAS. Uh, new issues are opening up on GitHub, and that gives us more insight into what the community wants. Uh, Super Gradients now has contributors from outside of Desi, um, and so you can expect more from from us in that respect. Uh, if you haven't 
yet given yolo nas a try well then you can click on this qr code here and that'll take you to a quick start um, guide that'll show you the you know how to how to predict with yolo nas and how to fine tune it um, predicting super easy um, this model that predicting was a lesson that we learned as well because before uh, I had to advocate and fight for this <laughs> because if you would have seen the code that uh, I was supposed to use uh, to get this thing to run, you would have not used the OLNAS because it was way too complicated and had too many steps. Um, and you know, I knew that the community would not be on board with that, so I had to fight for this new function. But this new function uh, just made it so much easier for us to to you know, show people how to use the OLNAS. Um, so again. Quick start for Yolo NAS. You could check it out right here. Um, scan that QR code. It'll open up a Jupyter Notebook, and that Jupyter Notebook will show you how to use Super Gradients and show you how to use Yolo NAS. Uh, if you want to connect with me on Twitter, please do. It's another QR code. And that is all for me. Great. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. Uh, really appreciate you talking about both the, both the technical challenge as well as like some of the more like communication slash organizational challenge of building this project. And um, yeah, um, um, thanks for sharing the notebook as well as like, you know, the, the benchmark that, that, you know, you're competing with. I think hopefully we can see more and more uh, uh, contribution, right, from, from, from folks to, uh, I guess, like designing like even a better, um, application model in the future yeah 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 looking forward to seeing what's next i mean we're um you know yellow nas pose estimation is on the way it's on the horizon um in a week or two we are uh releasing to our model zoo decker pose estimation um our version of decker at least so keep an eye out for that as well um, another open source library will be uh, releasing in July is called data gradients, which is like a, a nice EDA tool for object detection. Um, mm -hmm. So keep an eye out for that as well. Fabulous, yeah. I'm looking forward to um, to see some of those um, um, product launch and then definitely uh, give it a shout out to the the, the DCI team. Um, yeah, so we're running a little bit over time, but um, thanks everyone for for joining. Um, we'll um, have the recording of this session uh, available on YouTube. Um, within the next like two or three, three days. And then we'll send it out to all the attendees as well as um, you know, anyone who attend um, on our meetup our page uh, and other channels. Um, I think, um, uh, yeah, and, and the, the speakers, you know, if you have any question for them, you can also um, write to me and then, you know, I can facilitate uh, the answers. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks Vishakha, thanks Brani and Habrit for, um, you know, um, educating, educating us about, you know, vector database, multimodal learning, as well as uh, object detection uh, during this Friday afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care, Have everybody. a great weekend. Bye.